there's a lot of Python frameworks that help you kind of you know schedule things and and kind of scale things just by decorating a function. In which case, Hamilton, like we don't have to, you don't have to decorate all your functions. We can kind of just do that at runtime for you. So I'm kind of excited for this kind of yeah ability to kind of hide the the infrastructure details, but then you know give people the ability to kind of pick and choose things uh, depending on their context. Feature engineering space and general data engineering space, I think, is kind of you know has uh, some interesting problems to be solved. In which case, I think Hamilton presents an interesting solution where it's kind of pretty opinionated, uh, pretty esoteric. Uh, but you can still do everything that you want in Python. It just kind of, you know, makes this this problem of, you know, managing the central kind of, you, you could say, script to kind of create an object kind of go away. And instead, it's kind of the framework just takes care of it. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast, where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, we're talking with Stefan Krafczyk. Stefan is a data-focused leader and polymath engineer. His interests have spanned design, implementation, integration, and peer education of data-related systems. Most recently, his focus has been on futurization and model-serving systems and platforms. He holds a bachelor's in computer science and mathematics from Victoria University at Wellington and a master's in computer science from Stanford University specializing in artificial intelligence. Thank you for being on the podcast today, Stefan. Thanks, Justin. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Just love talking with people that are doing some fascinating stuff in the areas of artificial intelligence, since the podcast and the meetup group, all that stuff is really focused around applied AI. So really excited to talk about some of the projects that you've been working on and sort of where you're headed in your career. But maybe you can bring the listeners up to speed with regards to, you know, I mentioned you graduating from university and stuff. Like, how did you get to where you are today? You know, what were some of the paths, some of the companies you worked at? And maybe talk about the trajectory of your career. So I did my undergrad in New Zealand, so I grew up in Wellington. You know, Silicon Valley was where it's at for doing anything kind of computer science. So in which case, I got an opportunity to do kind of an internship uh, with IBM in San Jose. So I did that. And then I was like, my internship was, was coming to an end. What do I do now? I went to grad school, so I applied to grad school in California. And so I'd gone to Stanford and did my master's in computer science there. It was, you know, right before all the deep learning stuff came out. So, you know, I'm still, you know, behind on, on that coursework. But, you know, the, the PhDs at Stanford were, were coming up with this stuff um, at, that, at, at that time. I did an internship at Honda Research because I was trying to figure out, you know, do I want to do a PhD or do I want to do more researchy stuff? And so I built a, you know, a prototype of a spoken dialogue system there, which is kind of interesting. And the idea is that I was building a little prototype that, that you know, researchers could then use for their work, but then obviously those ideas would eventually kind of make, it, make its way into the car. But obviously that takes like, you know, years for it to actually to come through, given the nature of just how, how, how that kind of research uh, arm of Honda kind of operates. And so I was like, no, I don't want to do that. So then after graduating Stanford, I actually joined LinkedIn. It was right at the time before you know, IPO. I guess lucky that I landed there because I saw, you know, tremendous growth, what, what it kind of means to be a hyper growth company and stuff. But I initially uh, was doing, you know, kind of back end, you know, address book importing infrastructure. I was on like a, gr- a growth team to try to, you know, grow LinkedIn. It was kind of interesting to kind of see how to be metrics focused. Our product manager was very much focused on metrics, so it was very easy then to like, I guess, see that thinking. And therefore, you know, if I had an idea that could move metrics, so it was like, you know, I could just go forward and kind of implement it, and you know, he'd be happy. What was the time frame? I guess what were what were the years we're talking about here? 2010, 2012. But you know, I did this kind of AI specialization. I wasn't doing any machine learning, so I kind of switched teams for a bit to kind of you know prototype content based recommendation products. So that was kind of a you know a good learning of using all the tools and seeing how difficult and what are the problems that arise when you know. There are, there are all these data sets and you don't know if you can trust them. What do you have to do to clean them, et cetera? And then, you know, just the, the what is the iteration cycle? You know, like getting a model out to production, you know, was actually pretty hard. And so uh, then I guess I, I wanted to, to go to someplace smaller. So I went to kind of Nextdoor and was was like kind of engineer number 13 there. And so I got to build a lot of first versions of, every, of a few things, email analytics infrastructure, data warehousing infrastructure, A-B testing experimentation ex- infrastructure, a lot of kind of zero to one and one to kind of two versions of things. And so that was uh, a, a good lesson on like just you know, how do you iterate, how do you get something off the ground? And while I was there, I was kind of, you know, yeah, interesting to see just how people, you know, talked about data. As, as coming, uh, data was, you know, this was in vogue, or how do you become data driven was kind of right around that time. And so Building an experimentation system, uh, you know, definitely kind of helped with that. So then you could, you know, if you had an idea, you could iterate on it. 
put it behind some sort of, you know, feature flag, roll it out, test it, et cetera. And so, and then show metrics where that worked, worked or didn't. And so was pretty passionate about that kind of aspect of, of how you work. And then wanting to focus a bit more on machine learning infrastructure, because, you know, Nextdoor wasn't at the time where, you know, that was super critical to the company and what it was doing. I went to kind of NLP, an NLP for enterprise company. So some PhDs out of Stanford wanted to kind of create this company. So, so I knew them kind of from Stanford. You know, exciting time was, yeah, how, how do you build a machine learning model and then, you know, put it behind an API? Like that wasn't uh, again, was actually kind of pretty challenging at that time. Mm-hmm. For instance, like you, like back in the day, you used to build a Spark model, but you could only use the model on Spark. So if you wanted to like h- have a web service that then kind of sent, sent you a request for a classification, you kind of had to like figure out your own way of like, of doing it. And so that's where I kind of got, got into the guts there of like machine learning infrastructure. How do you think about like what is a model? Like how do you then like take it from, you, you've trained it in one piece of infrastructure, but then you want to s- serve an API request with it. And so then I went to Stitch Fix, uh, where I've kind of you know been for the last six years. Just recently, kind of transitioned away from it. But essentially, I was there, you know, engineering for data science was very kind of attractive there because there's I grew to enjoy building more of the infrastructure than doing the modeling. So I was less excited by a data set and figuring out what to do with it, and more so like helping someone, you know, actually make make the best use of the data set without having to do a lot of work to do so. So Stitch Fix, yeah, I got to kind of focus on a wide swath of problems from, you know, deployment, experimentation to, you know, training and inference. And uh, yeah, and so hence, like some of the uh, we've tooling, I guess, well, our discussion points today will be kind of around the stuff that I've done at Stitch Fix. Wow. Fascinating career, man. You've worked at some really, really interesting companies and, you know, gotten in early, it seems like, with a lot of these ones. And just to think back, like, you know, next door, you, you know, they were probably very small at that time, but like, how are they going to use all of this data around neighborhoods and, and just thinking through how you sort of bring that to life, I think is, is really, really fascinating. And then, you know, to talk with this NLP enterprise company, I was thinking about TensorFlow serving, right? That's, that's one of the, that's one of the things that maybe now exists. A lot of companies are building stuff on, but at the time you were on the early, early side of this. So Boy, I mean, how, how have you seen, and, and I know we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Hamilton and, and some of the micro framework, but like, yeah, I mean, just having a model and building something out of a Jupyter notebook is totally different than actually deploying it. And it seems like you've, as you said, maybe engineering for data science is where you've moved yourself more and more into these days. What are some of the current challenges, I guess, that companies aren't thinking about or that you're, you're seeing them not? Uh, yeah, how, how are you trying to approach this? Maybe it's not a problem, but it's a challenge, I guess, for, for companies to really deploy these models into production. Part of the challenge is actually the, the environment that you operate in within a company. So like the companies that I've worked at have, you know, they've been around, they've been engineering focused. So in which case the like machine learning and kind of aspects of thing have kind of, you know, came from an engineering kind of discipline or background. In which case, you know, people, if they were doing, you know, machine learning five years ago, they've built their own infrastructure basically. But now, like if you, uh, you know, starting your own startup, your own company, like there are so many tools uh, available to you that like it's actually, you know, probably the hardest part is actually choosing one. You know, the problem used to be it was difficult to kind of go from JupyterHub to, to having an API service. Like that is, I want to say, pretty, pretty easy these days. And so now I think we're, you know, part of the decision making or difficulty there is just, you know, if you're a data scientist, who's supporting you? Do you have an engineering team? Do you have an IT team? Can you deploy stuff yourself or not? In which case, you know, you, there's a bit of like figuring out as to like, you know, what you can do yourself, I think, at, at companies at least outside Silicon Valley. But otherwise, I, I think in terms of the last kind of, you know, six months to a year, I think the, the trend has been, okay, it's been easy to deploy models. Now I can get my models to production. Okay, oops, now no, there, there's bugs and, you know, data issues. How do we figure out what's, what's going on? To me, it seems analogous to uh, microservice, how microservice architectures came about. It used to be really hard to deploy a service. Now it's really easy. Everyone does, you know, microservice architectures. But then, oh, look, there's all these other problems now that crop up with all these kind of architectures. So I want to say with, with model building is similar. Uh, I think it's the analogy is similar in that it was difficult. Now it's easier to deploy. But now there is, oh, uh, you know, there are problems now of like, you know, what happens in production? How do I know that this model is, you know, healthy? Maybe it's the data. Maybe it's that they're just getting for, for predictions. Or maybe it's the training data somehow changed and now you're not getting the results you expect. So I think that's where right now, I think, you know, there's a bit more of a, a focus and movement towards in general and kind of ML ops or industry is like, yeah, how do you... Now that deployment is solved or at least it's much easier than before. Now people are probably spending their time actually, you know, figuring out what's going on in production. And so there's like a lot of tooling and, you know, startups around that kind of are cropping up. Gotcha. So yeah, it's really around, I, I guess I would just say validating that the predictions you're getting are what you're expecting and maybe a lot of logging and just visibility, I guess, in general, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, so you can, I mean, so you can, you can log stuff, but then like, you know, do you, it's like trying to automate the, 
the analysis and like coming up with tooling where it's, yeah, you, you just connect the logs and then th things can magically kind of, um, you get some sort of in indicator of, you know, via some summary statistics, like, hey, look, there's, there's model drift, there's a model drift, or like, hey, input features are matching or, do, or not matching. So I think just basically the, you know, rather than people doing bespoke things as they did kind of before, um, uh -huh. having to, you know, being able to pull something off the shelf and, and you could even pay for it rather than building it yourself. Yeah. So as I have alluded to before, you know, maybe talking a little bit about Hamilton now, this is an open source Python uh, micro framework. And I'll, I'll let you explain a little bit about, you know, kind of how, how it gets used and, and, you know, sort of how it fits into the entire, I guess, ecosystem. But the fact that it's open source, I think is phenomenal. It's really cool. Were you, were you driven by, I mean, have, have you contributed to other open source projects? Do you find yourself being very much interested in open source and in, in general? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, especially, I think if you're in any data-related space, like most of the tooling you're probably using, especially, especially if you've been doing it for a few years, is like some sort of open source tooling. So, yeah. you know, PyTorch being big, TensorFlow, I mean, they're all kind of, you know, open source products. I mean, and then the infrastructure it runs on top of, like Docker or, you know, kind of Kubernetes and things, right? They're, they're all kind of open source. So I think if you had been doing this for a while, most of your stuff is open source. So, you know, I fixed bugs here and there or in, in, in various kind of Python libraries because I would say most of the libraries that, you know, we use under the hood, even like, you know, if you, if you use AWS, you're using AWS's open source Python libraries, right? I mean, like, you're using a lot of open source. So in which case, it's, uh, you know, I, I fixed a few bugs here and there. And then in terms of like the impetus for Hamilton, it was, uh, you know, I was kind of seeing like, hey, all, all these similar tools and frameworks come out. I'm like, hey, we've been, we've had this for a few years. This mm. looks actually pretty, pretty easy to open source. I think one of the hard parts with companies with open sourcing is you end up coupling a lot of your company's concerns with things. And so, in which case with Hamilton, actually, it was, there weren't that many concerns to couple. And so actually from a, a standpoint of like making the code open source pool was actually, was a, was a pretty easy lift. And so in which case that was like, I was like, yeah, sure, let's, let's, let's open source it, see, see the, uh, the reaction. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, tell us a little bit then here about, about the project Hamilton, how it got started and, and uh, yeah. what it does. I'm still trying to figure out like what is the most succinct way to kind of, you know, explain Hamilton. <laughs> sure. But essentially it's, you know, it, it, it's a bit of a Swiss army knife, so hence the difficulty. But essentially, uh, you know, it's a, um, I want to call it a micro framework for creating data flows from Python functions, where the Python functions are kind of described in a declarative manner. And so what I mean by micro, micro framework, so it's not an orchestration system. It doesn't kind of replace your infrastructure. It actually helps you model you know, a single step and say your workflow. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in terms of the origin story in, in a little bit. But you can run it anywhere that you can run Python. And so that's why it's kind of like a micro framework because it forces you to write these functions in this kind of declarative manner. So it's this fix. It kind of, you know, we, we created it for a team that was, you know, trying to manage a, a large time series feature engineering kind of code base. They, on, you know, they were creating thousands of features and this code mm. base was kind of becoming pretty unmanageable for them. And so in which case, it was mainly the, in time series forecasting, for those who don't know, like most of the feature engineering that you're doing is w when you're creating new features, they're generally some derivative of other features. So in the case of, you know, with time series you're doing, you, you might have one one feature, then you're doing lag, uh, you know, you're shifting the time around, you, you're doing various transforms on kind of, you know, time series column that kind of uh, uh, inputs to create more features. And so, in which case you can you end up building this kind of chain dependency of features. And if you if you uh, you know write a, a say a, a pandas script where you're manipulating a single data frame where you're adding all these columns as new features, five or ten, you know that script is pretty manageable. But you know if you have like thousands of, of columns in a single script, that you know that code base isn't isn't very nice to kind of touch because you know you lose things like you know unit testability. Sure, you can put things into functions, but then you know there's there's many ways to write those functions. Documentation is difficult because, you know, if you're doing a lot of inline pandas kind of column creation, then like, yeah, you, there isn't any place really to put documentation. And then the, the the order of the script kind of matters. So if you're onboarding and you're tasked with changing something or adding something, how do you know you're not going to, you know, you know, change something? It's very hard for you to kind of grok. And so which case uh, with that team, because uh, at Stitch Fix, it was like one of the oldest teams at Stitch Fix, their code base was, you know, old. And so which case, the most tenured people were the most productive and it took like, you know, new people, new hires, you know, quite a while to kind of ramp up. Because we were an engineering for, for data science team, kind of was tasked with, you know, can we kind of reframe this problem a little to kind of, you know, uh, uh, get at their pain points. And so we, you know, the project was kind of started with the goals of, you know, can we make everything unit testable? 
can we make sure that documentation is pretty easy? And then can we kind of improve their kind of workflow for adding new features? Because with this team, they had to provide operational forecasts to the business. So they're always going to be adding new features kind of on a monthly basis because, you know, there was a new marketing campaign or there was, you know, some new experiment that changed some numbers. So they need to add and, you know, go change some features because they were really trying to model the business. So before Hamilton, something, they had a monthly task that would take them like a day. And then after Hamilton, migrating into, into the, you know, using the micro framework, right? That task now takes them less than two hours. And it wasn't from, you know, new technology in terms of speeding up computation or anything like that. No, it was just kind of changing the way that they write code. And so, which is the kind of the core of Hamilton is that it, it kind of forces this, this, this way for you to kind of think of and describe and, and kind of write features. In terms of just to give you a, a, a bit of a sense of like what the code actually looks like and what these functions you're actually writing. So picture a script, a panda script, where you have a, a, a data frame object and you're kind of just creating new columns. In, in Hamilton, you would create a function where the name of the function describes, you know, is the name of the output column that you're trying to create. Yes. And then the input arguments to the function are either input columns that this kind of function requires to do to perform its kind of transformation or computation. And so the body of the function becomes, you know, holds the logic. You can use function docs because it's a, it's a Python function. So, and then because of the, the way that the function is written, it's very easy to unit test because it's, you know, you're not leaking where the data comes from. You're just kind of writing this function where the you know, name of the function is what will output. And then the inputs are, are other kind of input functions. And so once you build up these functions, we then, to stitch everything together, we, you know, you do some computer science 101 and we build a directed acyclic graph. And so we stitch everything together by name. So if a function needs an input called date, we will either look for a function called date or expect date to be passed as an input type of thing. And so what this paradigm really changes is that, you know, you're writing your logic independent of how you're going to call it and how you're going to kind of create it. So you kind of write things in two phases or at least there's like two steps. So you write these kind of Hamilton functions and then you write a little driver script, which kind of says, you know, what, sh what is my DAG or directed by cyclic graph that I want to build? And then what are the outputs that I want? And then we will, the little, the framework will kind of walk the DAG to only compute the things that are needed and, you know, provide you kind of the result from there, assuming you provide the right inputs. So, so that's kind of, you know, Hamilton, kind of roughly high level, but yeah, it's open source. Yeah, check us out. I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. This is phenomenal. This is, this is awesome. And I, and I think, so we have liner notes for the podcast and I will absolutely put a bunch of links and it's just github.com forward slash stitch fix forward slash Hamilton, I think is what I've been looking at. Yep. And you kind of walked us through sort of your readme here with, with regards to super simple for people to install, just a pip install. The, you sort of walk through a sort of first hello world example where it's like, hey, you have these columns of things, but maybe you want to do, and in this case, I see an average for a three-week spend, for example. And so it feels like it's auto-documenting, right? It kind of forces you to, to write the documentation along the way. Is that is that true? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you even, like at Stitch Fix, the team end up settling on like a naming convention because, you know, rather than having some variable named foo, like Hamilton really forces you to name the functions to be like topic meaningful along with the inputs. Then when you come to read it, you can kind of go, oh, this is, you know, average three-week spend is the name of the function. And then, oh, look, what, what's its input? Oh, it's, it takes spend as input. And then, I don't know, maybe some other parameters or, or something. And then, oh, then it's kind of pretty, you know, clear from you to kind of read or at least try to understand. Then when you go to read the body of the logic, you're like, oh, look, it's doing an average. And oh, look, there's a number three. Okay, I kind of understand what's going on. This was, you, know, you could say gut instinct, didn't know how, how well this would turn out. But essentially, that's kind of, it kind of forces uh, yeah, better naming. And then obviously, and, and then the code is a little bit more readable. And so which case, like it's, uh, at Stitch Fix, the, the team, you know, onboarding became much easier, much simpler, someone to get started with. Because one of the, also the nice things with, you know, focusing on the naming is that if you have some output and you want to understand, you know, what created it, you know, just grab the code or command F for, for that name. And then you'll, you, it's pretty easy to find the definition. Or at least like, hey, I wonder what uses this. It's very easy to then figure out kind of the dependencies of, you know, where something is also consumed. So updating the code, maintaining it, finding things about it is much simpler because it's like yeah, everything is forced to be kind of broken up into functions. Yeah, yeah. It feels very um, like behavior driven development, I guess, in some ways where you sort of, yeah, do a lot of explanation. Now, does that help then with the data scientists, I guess, people that are on the data scientist team? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so they, um, the code base now looks pretty Uniform, I guess. I think that's one of the things that, you know, you, you don't really learn about when you're writing code until you've written enough of it over time and have to come back to your own code, et cetera. And so mm. in which case, you know, the code base is pretty uniform. Everything is kind of, you know, done in the in, in this kind of very structured way. Because they're Python functions, you can then, you know, curate them into modules. So then you can, you know, 
thematically have you know, all the date features and a dates.py and all, all the marketing features and mm. marketing.py. So like it helps kind of organize and structure things. And so obviously maybe there's a little bit of friction to get started because you're not doing a one line pandas kind of, you know, statement. You are writing a function and you have to like figure out where to put, where, you know, which module it, it, it should, you know, uh, live in. But then longer term, then that means anyone who's coming back to the code, maintaining it, et cetera, is like that, that is just much, much simpler. And so. We can also visualize the execution. So given the the, the graph nature of, of the computation, we, we we can also output, you know, give you a visual picture of, you know, what's going to happen as well. Yeah, so in which I, case, like, it, it helps, you know, the data scientists, you know, from the iteration perspective, so if they have to come and add things. So, you know, Hamilton will tell you if there's if there's two functions named the same thing that you're trying to build uh -huh. a diagram, in which case, like, it's very hard to step on someone else's toes. So if you want to create a new feature, you know, it's just that's a new function. And you know that's independent as long as it's, you know, named something different. And then if you want to update or change, like, how something's computed, you then have to, you know, add, uh, say, a new dependency in that function. So then, you know, it's very clear to someone who's reviewing the code, like, oh, what are the, what are the impacts and what's going to happen? It just helps them speed up the, the general maintenance activities and, uh, you know, just manage the code base without fighting it. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, so at the end of all of this, so sort of close the loop then for us, at the end of this, you just, you end up getting a data frame that is sort of a a, a, a combination of all these features that you added, right? I mean, Hamilton isn't, uh, works over any, any Python data type, but if you're modeling any kind of tabular type thing, Hamilton kind of, yeah, works really, really well with it, especially for, uh, for Panda stuff. It does get you to think about things in a columnar fashion. So I think one of the things that most people, you know, at least I, rem I remember going back, you know, you used to for loops and doing everything in like in a, in a row based kind of processing fashion. But mm. Hamilton, you know, it forces you to think of them in more of a columnar fashion. You can do things row based, but then the upside is that most of your computation can also be quicker because, you know, vector computation is, is faster when you're working over columns and stuff. So at least it's districts and what it grew out. We're, we're trying to manage a pandas data frame. So in which case, yeah, you just kind of, you know, you, you can get a pandas data frame. But if you wanted to build, you know, a, a scikit-learn model, you can also, you know, model that kind of ETL kind of process with Hamilton as well. Yeah, awesome. And it looks like it's it's been, I mean, there's it's it's in active development. I see, you know, people committing stuff just, you know, four days ago, 10 days yeah. ago, all that, all that type of stuff. What's the... What's the future for it right now? I mean, you're looking at what you're going to do next in your in in your career. What do you what do you see for this uh, project? Yeah, I mean, so Hamilton, I think is you know it's interesting from the perspective that it's trying not to to leak too many kind of underlying computational kind of platform infrastructure kind of concerns. So that's one of the things that Stitcher is like. Yeah, we wanted to build an API where the data scientists could do their work, but without really having without leaking, you know, that it's running on Spark or or, or right. you know, where it's kind of running. Because uh, ideally, we can you know as as a platform then you know uh, change things without people having to migrate. Because that was one of the taboo words at Stitchfix for data scientists was migration. I mean, so you know, being able to build, trying to build an API where you didn't have to migrate, or at least the migration pain, if, if there was some to bear, was like pretty minimal. So uh, I'm pretty kind of excited where where you know I think by the time this podcast drops, we'll hopefully have a, a you know a data quality kind of feature. So one of the nice things with with having functions is like the idea is that well why why can't we just add a decorator? So this is like an annotation. So when you see a Python, uh, you know, at something above a function, that's what I'm kind of describing as a decorator. Wouldn't it be cool to also, you know, ha have a runtime expectation set there? So if you have, you're computing, you know, the age kind of feature or something, you can then say, hey, this, is, this should be above zero. It should be between, you know, you know uh, zero and, you know, 120 or something. And yeah. that would be in the code. So then the, the maintenance of the code, then it's like very easy to kind of see when you, if you were to look up the logic or understand what's going on, like the test is kind of described with the code. So I'm kind of excited for that. And then there's a lot of Python frameworks that help you kind of, you know, schedule things and, and kind of scale things just by decorating a function. In which case, Hamilton, like we don't have to, you don't have to decorate all your functions. We can kind of just do that at runtime for you. So we have an integration with Ray and Dask, where you know it's very easy to kind of scale the computation with Hamilton without you having to kind of rewrite your your code or logic, or even know that you want to scale onto these systems. It's very easy to kind of you just got to change what we call the driver code, so the thing that kind of you know tells Hamilton what what DAG to build, and then you just got to you know say, hey, I wanted this to be computed on, on Ray or Dask. And then if you happen to be using Pandas, then we also, you know, can delegate to Pandas on Spark, which came out in 3.2, so that, you know, you, you can kind of, you know, write your functions and then they'll just run on Spark as well. So I'm kind of excited for this kind of, yeah, ability to kind of hide the, the infrastructure details, but then, you know, give people the ability to kind of pick and choose things depending on their context. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of roughly where hopefully I'll be spending my time, but otherwise, 
yeah, I mean, the uh, feature engineering space and general data engineering space, I think, is kind of, you know, has some interesting problems to be solved, in which case I think Hamilton presents an interesting solution where it's kind of pretty opinionated, uh, pretty esoteric, but you can still do everything that you want in Python. It just kind of, you know, makes this this problem of, you know, managing the central kind of, you, you could say, script to kind of create an object and kind of go away. And instead, it's kind of the framework just takes care of it. Yeah, so that's awesome. How, how, so how long has Hamilton been around? When did you start the project? It went live at Stitch, Stitch Fix, you know, November 2019. So okay. we actually, you know, it's been running, it's been running in you know, at Stitch Fix for, for, for quite a while before we, we open sourced it. We open sourced, I guess, October 2021. And yeah, there's, we have a you know, community on Slack. I've gotten some interesting conversations with people just trying to get Hamilton up and running. So for instance, you know, I was talking to a consultant the other day and he was like, Hamilton sounds like, you know, a, a, a pretty great tool for me because it ensures that, you know, I leave code that is documented and, you know, testable for my client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm bullish, obviously, you know, slightly biased, but <laughs> um, yeah, watch the space. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's exciting. So you're going to continue to, to sort of work in this in the same arena, you think, here going forward, personally? I mean, I want to say, so Stitch Fix, we, we were, I think, slightly kind of you know, avant-garde, uh, uh, you know, ahead of the time in terms of being, trying to enable the, the person who's doing the data work to take things uh, all the way to production. And I think, you know, that's a bit of a zeitgeist of, of, of the times as well. It's like, how can you enable the person who's doing the modeling to also take it to production? Because I think, you know, if you, if you allow that, you increase kind of iteration speed because there's less people to talk to. Now, the downsides are, you know, they might not be software engineers and like, you know, in some domains that could be, you know, a little tenuous, but then I think like with the right tooling and infrastructure and abstractions, I think you can, you know, get pretty close to enabling someone to, who, who isn't necessarily, you know, a super awesome engineer uh, to have the tooling to be able to, you know, get stuff to production without having to worry about it. And then, so then allowing them the time then to really focus on what's driving value for the business, which is probably building and creating better models. Yeah, for sure. So yes, I think I think I'll stay in the space because I think I yeah. <laughs> you sound very passionate about it for sure. Keeping keeping data scientists productive, focusing on what they do the best. Thank you for the work that you do. I mean, a, a lot of these frameworks, just in general, are, are sort of thankless professions in some ways. People spend a lot of hours, a lot of time focusing on building tooling and tool sets, and and you know, and then other people sort of. I guess that's open source. It's standing on the shoulders of giants. But anybody that spends time, you know, their own free time building. Building things for the open source community uh, has a ton of respect in my book. So thank you very much for doing that. As people are coming out of school, for example, say these days, I mean, what, how do you suggest they get into this field? This is a question I, I love to ask people that have maybe been in this data science, machine learning yeah. space. I mean, you should understand the tools that you're using. So the nice thing with open source is that you can kind of go, at, you know, look at the code. You can learn a lot by just reading code. And so that was one of, the, one of the things that I learned, I guess, in, in my career. I mean, if you happen to, to go work at Google or, you know, one of, one of the bigger companies, you know, reading their code bases is actually, you know, like something that will kind of teach you a few things because I think there are, you know, problems and patterns, problems that crop up perennially, right? And so like, what are the patterns and approaches that you can kind of use to solve these problems? How to deploy something to production? I think, you know, there, there's a lot of open source tooling. So in which case you can, if you, if you can read code and, you know, like I guess my general methodology is, you know, read code, draw it, the, re- the representation so you can kind of understand the full picture. And then like that can give you at least some sort of mental model of, you know, like why things are working or how things work the way they do. So then that, what, what that I think, you know, provides you is you know, maybe a better understanding of the tooling or at least maybe even more insight as to like how you can use it better. And then with open source, obviously, there's the other side is that, you know, you can then potentially, you know, contribute back or create issues like, hey, would this feature, you know, fit with this thing? And so I think, you know, tools and stuff like love feedback are around these types of things. But yeah, I think if I new college grads, I guess the, the downside right now is that there's a lot of tooling that abstracts a lot of the things that you used to have to like build yourself. Um, oh, yeah. And so in which case, that's why I'm like, yeah, you, you should read the code base so you can at least know maybe then you also understand a little bit of history and know where things came from. But but yeah, otherwise, you can move so much faster these days. So the other way is just, you know, use the tooling to just build as quickly as possible so you can iterate and, you know, develop that kind of, you know, experience and even like, you know, intuition for, you know, what's a good idea? How fast does it take? Because I think it's the other thing that you learn through industry and experiences, you know, like sizing things, in which case knowing like what are the, the hard problems or knowing how, 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 how long things will take, in which case. And then like, what are like, you know, the methods that you should be looking at to kind of start a project, I think. So the only way to get better at that is just to kind of iterate and, and, you know, and try to do, you know, more new projects each time. So, you know, this, this is, you know, true, I think for engineering, true for data science. So like what features or how do, how do you explore data? You know, what should you do first to really understand the problem before you're going on, right? 
And then you can then relate that back to also, you know, whatever business you're working at, because because if you know the sizing and ha- and potentially like you know what are good ways to start or solve problems, you can then and then if you know the business value or potential business impact, you can then also then you know help that target like where you should focus your work or time. It just makes you more valuable, you know, as a as a person working with the company or for the company or whatever it is. And it's 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 good. That's one of the things that I tell engineers is is you know you people need to understand why they're building what they're building. It's you know the more that the engineers know the better they can actually do their job. It's not just, hey, code this and make this do this certain way. It's, we want to build this solution here. What do you think is the best way? So the more an engineer can sort of raise their hand and say, well, I'm going to attack it this way, or I'm going to try it this way. Or some ways, as you were talking about, I was saying, you know, wow, just, just try and break the system, you know, like look at it and mm-hmm. say, well, what happens, if I, what happens if I throw this variable in? Or what happens if I do this? You'll, you'll learn a ton just by actually getting compilation errors or, or getting data spit out a different way. It's like, hmm, that didn't react the way I thought it did. So why don't I dig in further to understand it? Totally. Yeah. Well, how do people reach out and connect with you? So I'm, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. I have a you know, Twitter handle. Feel free to yeah, ping me on Twitter. I'll see yeah, LinkedIn as well. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a blog or anything, actually. I mean, I've been trying to publish a little bit on towards data science. So you can also, I guess, follow me on, on Medium as well. But yeah, happy to take, uh, I guess, questions or, 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 yeah, if someone wants to message me, ask me about, you know, something that I did or, or, or a career choice, you know, happy to try to help if I have the time. For sure, for sure. And I'll just, I'll do a quick plug in here. You'll be speaking at our Applied AI meetup on November 3rd. So I'll be sure and put a link in that in the liner notes as well. Of course, links off to your LinkedIn and all the other stuff. You know, is there any other, I guess, topics or projects that you find interesting or other things that maybe you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover today? One of the, the projects I've spoken about before was, was, was this project called the Model Envelope. It was a, a core abstraction that essentially enabled us to kind of build a little framework where you could you know, save a model and then a data scientist didn't have to write the code to kind of create a web service that you know, spat out predictions from the model or write a kind of ba- a batch task to kind of run the model in batch. And the, the, the metaphor we're kind of going for is it's an envelope because it's not only the model puts in, but you can st- stuff other things with it. And so it essentially mm-hmm. was a, a kind of a self-describing, it, it contained all, all the data we needed to be able to kind of self-describe a model such that given a context, we could kind of generate the code to kind of run that model in that specific uh, context. So Usually with Python models and things, you need to get, you know, Python dependencies correctly. Similarly, like if you want to create a type safe API, so you want to check that, you know, the, the values uh, are ints or strings or, or floats, you kind of have to, you know, manually do that. And so in which case we built a system where it's like, yeah, we uh, given a model, we figure out what its API inputs uh, and outputs are, obviously with some help from, you know, uh, what you pass to us in the kind of the save API call. And then it's like, yeah, essentially it, it kind of, we, we treat it as a black box. So like this kind of UDF, so a, a user-defined function, but with, with, with state because it's a model. And so from there it was, yeah, we, uh, you know, a data scientist could, you know, save a model and then under an hour have that model. It was kind of the, the crux of, 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 of the abstraction was like, yeah, we saved everything we needed to know about a model and then getting it to production was just, you know, just a few clicks of, you know, a, a UI and some configuration, like the name of the service you want it the, to be deployed. And then, yeah, data scientists could, you know, easily get things to production pretty quickly. That's phenomenal. Yeah, no, that's so this, I guess I saw that you presented here at MLConf online 2021, sort of talking about this. Yeah, yeah. So I spoke about MLConf. I also did, you know, a session at Stanford's kind of machine learning systems design course on this topic as well. It was a guest lecture there. On it. But essentially, yeah, it was an abstraction to kind of, yeah, you know, enable deployment for free, as we kind of called it. But the the the, the flip, the other part of it is from an ML, MLOps perspective, it actually enabled us to kind of control and do a lot, which, you know, previously you you wouldn't kind of, as a platform team, necessarily have all the kind of the ability to kind of do so. Since the abstraction was you uh, given, you just trained a model, you would save it. There wouldn't be like a, a, a deploy command at the end of your kind of model training process. No, we purposely kind of abstracted it that you had to kind of create this kind of rule set to then you create your, you curated your models in your model envelopes with tags. And so then given, you know, some tags and the properties of the model say, we only want to deploy the model if it was, you know, trained off of, you know, the main branch from the particular Git repo and it has these kind of tags, we would then kind of, you know, automatically say deploy a web service with that model. Because we controlled all of the de- deployment prospects or in the end, the, all of the de- deployment kind of end to end, it meant that, you know, we could, you know, it's very easy for us to kind of change the underlying architecture of, you know, what happens and data scientists don't have to do anything to benefit from it. If we want to ensure that all machine learning models have, you know, Datadog integration with a specific kind of 
set up, it was very easy for us to kind of do so. Data scientists just got it for free when, whenever we upgraded and, you know, touched the system. So from a platform perspective, it was, you know, a great abstraction for us to really be able to kind of, you know, as we got better at things, just, you know, be a re- uh, the tide that kind of raised all boats. Whereas kind of before, when everyone was kind of deploying their own models, doing their own bespoke things, it was very kind of, you know, some models had very good, you know, observability and, and kind of coverage or even, you know, deployment kind of systems. Whereas with Model Envelope, we kind of standardized a lot of it and then made it like, you know, a, a lot more amenable for, for platform teams to kind of manage without having, you know, pains of, without the data scientists essentially having to migrate any code where, whenever we, we change anything. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. The AI is just looking at here, they says no code needs to be written by a data scientist to deploy any Python model to production. So super useful there in that particular case. Similar in spirit to kind of MLflow or ModelDB, which were kind of the, the entrance in the space. We built it because, you know, we, at the time we started building it, there was no, nothing open source that kind of fit our bill. Most of the open source systems at the time were very much focused on making individual you know, productive, but it's just because we had, you know, over a hundred data scientists. And so in which case building a system where that would scale to enable like, you know, a lot of models and kind of being able to arbitrarily organize them was kind of one of the key kind of requirements for us. So in which case we went with kind of a tagging model, which then allows you to kind of, you know, arbitrarily create hierarchies based on the tags that you kind of use as a way to kind of group and manage models. We also then, uh, that enables us to, to build our own kind of uh, CI, CD, so continuous integration, continuous deployment kind of process. So if you wanted to deploy your model to a staging environment, run some checks and then deploy it to production, it was very easy to kind of set it up with the, with the model envelope kind of uh, deployment system. I love it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, on that note, Stefan, really excited to have you on the program. This was great conversation and really excited to sort of get this published and put out into the ether. So all of our Applied AI listeners here at, in the community can get a chance to download Hamilton, learn from it, and also, you know, we'll be having you present as well to our, to our group in a couple months. And so that'll be, that'll be awesome as well. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your insights and for all the hard work that you've been doing in this data science community to sort of start putting together a lot of these, these tools that I think a lot of data scientists need. It's a lot of the infrastructure and the plumbing and stuff that I think is missing to really, you know, I guess provide the full context of what artificial intelligence can can do today. So without all of the plumbing and a lot, a lot of the infrastructure, it's, it's not going to happen. So thank you again. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Justin. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.